same thing. So this is managing yourself, your thoughts, and others. Now that we've listened to code for a while, we can take a step back and, and work on some of our non-coding you know, personal development skills. Chris, you gotta like keep the mic. Yeah. That's it. Better? Okay. So now, now we're done uh, you know, looking at code. Let's look at some non-code, worry about interpersonal skills. Who am I? I moved here to Portland, uh, June 2016. I moved from Dallas. Uh, compared to this amazing view of beauty in all directions, Dallas is nothing but flat and concrete. They don't have even trees on the concrete. Very depressing. I used to organize the Dallas Ruby Brigade there. I spent a couple years doing that, and probably three or four years before that, just being a participant. I'm currently a senior developer at a company in Seattle called Media Pro. Uh, in the past, I've done some other jobs, like being a CTO of a three-person startup, a seven-person startup. I've been certified as a scrum master. I've been a team leader. Kind of bounced around these different positions. Speaking of Media Pro, we are hiring. I do have one of those nifty red stickers. Uh, we're looking for a few different positions, senior rails mostly, uh, DevOps, PMs. Uh, there's other positions if you know of people that aren't necessarily developers that are looking for tech jobs. Uh, send them to MediaPro.com. There's a link that says careers on the bottom. All right. Raise your hand if you have managed other people. Doesn't have to be with code, just manage. Wow. That's a lot of you. I'm impressed. Okay, how many of you have reported to intimidating bosses who may or may not have pointy hair? But they intimidate you, you don't want to make them mad ever. Very nice. And how many of you have felt like your boss has no idea what your team needs? Here, up here, they're shooting. All right, there we go, there we go. And how many of your team's successes are not being properly recognized by your boss? Probably quite a few, yeah. All right, this talk is for you. How many of you have a manager who has no idea what you do? Couldn't tell anybody else what your day-to-day -day actually is? A few, all right, this talk's for you. A uh, bit of a word of warning. Uh, now that you all know my employer, please remember these are my words. These are not, this is not media pro gospel. This is my words, my opinion. Uh, some of this advice might be risky, okay? Some bosses don't like the things that are in here. Uh, you may get fired if you try to push too hard on these things. That's normally how it works, right? You say something needs to be fixed and they just fire you instead. That could happen. That could happen. <laughs> but remember, developers usually have more leverage in the marketplace. They can find a new job. So don't stay at some soul-sucking job forever. But remember, if you cannot afford to be fired, you don't have enough rainy day, money in a rainy day fund, uh, please be very careful. Uh, don't blame me. There's the point to you. All right, so this is based off a few things. It's based off my personal experiences. I've been writing code since, I don't know, middle school. Uh, I first did Perl before I discovered Ruby. There's a night and day difference in communities. Compared to Perl, is just nothing but unicorns and rainbows and sunshine. Pearl, the first time I went to IRC, like the first five messages were just RTFM. Like, how did you ask this stupid question? What are you doing? Go look at the Ruby IRC. It's seriously, night and day difference. Just follow the two channels and see what I mean. So it's based on my experience and also these six books. If you have not read these six books, you probably should. Uh, if this is your first few years into uh, software development, if you are new out of a code school, uh, if you don't feel like you've got a super good handle on how to grow in your career, these books are for you. And the rest of this talk is a smattering of the advice that's in these six books, uh, my favorite pieces, plus a little bit of my own choice. All right, so we'll start with uh, probably the easiest part, managing yourself. All right, so super simple. All you have to do is master everything ever. No problem. I know you've got this. You're, you're confident, smart people. But realistically, it's you have to understand the business domain. It's not good enough just to know Ruby, just to know how to make something compile. 
you need to know why it's a business. What makes it profitable? What makes people want to use it? And you want to be, be well versed enough in that, not just to know the ins and outs, but maybe to become one of its authorities and be able to talk at a, at a conference about it. So speaking the language of the business domain is a critically useful skill, and it's also extremely marketable. You can put it on your resume, just like Reynolds. A little bit of personal experience here. Uh, at one of my previous startups, my CEO talked to a person that had been working in the industry for a decade, and that person did not know nearly as much about just how the business worked than some of the people that, that, that we have been working with just for a couple of months. And the night and day difference in how those interactions go is, is very extreme. You'll be able to tell. So the more you know about the industry, the more effective of a developer and a communicator with other people you're going to be. So related to that is being an information radiator. One way or another, make sure that you are not siloing information, that you are spreading it around your teammates. Maybe even build a wiki. Now this one's hotly debated in that and scrum groups, but one way or another, even if it's not a wiki, just some sort of knowledge base, some sort of repo of information that everybody knows to look at, uh, needs to exist. It needs to be well maintained. And so it'll also reduce some of the flow of glossy messages on Slack that yeah, if you're using the search function to go find that message from months ago repeatedly, please just put that on the wiki. Uh, you can put your status reports on the wiki if you want to. I highly recommend it. It gives you a, a good uh, history of all of that. But remember, don't forget who's reading those status reports and tailor it to them. All right. This one is really important. Do not be the best in the band. Don't be the best person there. Now, if you're at a startup, it's just you and a couple others, please be the best, right? You need to be the best. You have to. You have to wear all the hats. You have to wear all the things. But if you're working on a team, you have juniors, you have seniors, you have leads, you have managers, don't be the best. If you are the best, it's time to find a new job. Go somewhere where you can learn, where you can grow in your challenge. You want to also hire people better than you. You want to work for people that are smarter than you, that have done, that have accomplished more things than you have, and you want to use them to grow. Grow off other people's successes and their knowledge. And you want to seek lots of mentorship outside of work, like here at PDX Ruby. Now, this one's a pretty big problem in a lot of organizations. Just say no to my commander. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Fight it, leave, get fired. Just don't accept it in your life. The reason being is that micromanagers don't know what, you, what your job is, and they certainly don't trust you to do it. If they trusted you to do it, they would not be micromanaging you. Simple. They're not fighting for you when they're talking to their bosses. They're micromanaging you so they know every little mistake you make and they're defending themselves from you. It's a caustic situation. Don't accept it. It will not end well on your behalf. All right, so you want to participate in code reviews frequently. Now, if you're like me and you often have the imposter syndrome where you're like, I don't know, am I really deserving of that position? Am I, am I good enough to... to you know, to be considered for this, don't worry about that. Everybody should go through code reviews, and everybody makes mistakes. I still make the dumbest mistakes sometimes. It's perfectly fine. But through code review, you're going to learn. And you're going to not just learn about maybe how to do your stuff better, but ideas other people have that you have never, ever thought of. And if you're on a one-man team, a one-man startup, something like that, please find somebody to review your code. Make them sign an NDA if you have to, but don't do it all alone. You'll get better code at the end if you have at least a rubber duck. Even better if it's a real human. Speaking of seeking a mentor, you definitely need to have a mentor because their job is to help you when you get stuck. If you don't have a mentor, you can wind up spending hours and hours racking your brain. So if you have a mentor, it's a quick question. Much less stressful. A mentor can model behaviors and skills that you want to learn. If you're a junior, find a senior that's your mentor and model how they work. Help them help you to learn. 
Mentors can also help keep your career trajectory in the right direction. You can ask them advice. You can ask them about jobs, positions, frameworks, whatever. You can help make sure you're happy in your job. You can also warn you of potential, potential hazards uh, at your company. If you're a big company like v Relic, there's mentors out there that have worked here. And they can give you insight into how v Relic works. You want to find them, and you want to learn what they know. Mentors also will help keep you to a high standard because, of course, you don't want to be showing off your code to somebody in your code will bed, so you're going, to you're going to naturally try to do a better job to keep your mentor happy, to keep that relationship good. Finally, you want to manage your own image. You always need to be learning, but you also need to help others learn as well. You need to show them and tell them about the cool stuff that, that you learned, just like Jared did with us earlier, right? He said, look, stimulus is amazing, and you all need to check it out tomorrow. That sort of stuff, right? Keep telling other people about that. Everybody, all developers have a brand, whether they think they do or not, whether they know they do or not. It's their GitHub page, it's their Twitter, it's whatever I can find when I Google your name. That's your brand. So optimize it. Make yourself look better when people are searching for you, people Google. If you're a team builder, make sure that's in your brain. Make sure that's known publicly. If you take it upon yourself to improve morale, make sure that's known. And if you can, be the social, approachable one that helps solve problems. People will like you for that. But no matter what, own your own brand. Make it yours. Uh, in previous months, we've seen some really spectacular talks with really unique styles. That's personal brands talking. All right, part two, managing your boss. This is where it gets a little trickier. You need to understand where your manager comes from. Did your manager have an engineering pass? Were they in QA? Were they big in business? Did they just graduate uh, with an MBA from business school? Now, where is your manager at in life? And that's really going to determine how you communicate every day with your manager. If your manager used to be a senior, senior Ruby and Rails developer, you're going to communicate with them a lot differently than if your manager just moved over from the marketing department and has never written a line of code in their, in their life, right? And you need to know how to tailor your requests and your asks to your boss based on their experience so they can get it. You want to learn their language. Your manager is also your face to everybody else in the organization. Other people in the organization are going to come to your manager and ask about you. So you want to make sure that you know exactly what to say to your manager so they understand you fully. All right. One thing that I always encourage for management is if they have an engineering pass, they need to always be coding. Always, always, always. Doesn't have to be full time, doesn't even have to be a full day. Just every now and then make sure they're still familiar with kind of how it works. They can they can make a build pass, they can add a test, they can make a commit, it gets pushed to production and nothing breaks, right? They can be really small. It doesn't have to be good. But make sure they're still coding. Your manager should be, in my opinion, able to give you a detailed architecture diagram at any time of what they want you to build. And if they can't, they may not be the best person to manage you. But you also want to help your manager grow up the technical details enough to contribute in that small way. So while your manager should always be coding, they should be probably coding with you and making sure that everybody's on board. Here's one I don't think a lot of people ever really think, well, some people do, but many people just don't think about it. What, what are your manager's blind spots? How do they compensate? What is your manager just not good at? Or maybe even they don't know that they're not good at it. So all you gotta do is just ask them if they look stressed out in the day, and ask them how you can help. If they say you can't help at all, that's kind of bad news, right? You want your manager to be happy, you want your manager to be able to focus on you. And if they're stressed out running around and you can't help them at all, everybody's in a bad spot and people need to understand that and recognize it accordingly. Only then can they fix it. Good managers will rely on your team. Again, if you're hiring people better than yourself, Right? And you have a really smart team, and you can and should rely on them. 
Building great teams is a very important part of building a successful engineering department. Alright, so how does your manager talk to you? Your manager should always be in information acquisition mode. Always. So help them out, right? Help keep them up to date. Now, if your manager doesn't like the feedback that you hate their favorite feature, right? It's a favorite feature, they really wanted that button in the app, and you say that's the dumbest button you've ever seen. If they're not okay with that feedback, that's the red flag. Your manager should always be willing to say, cool, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that, that you don't like it. Thanks for letting me know. And if you're the only one, if you're the lone one out of the team, fine, right? Maybe no action will occur. But if your manager is not receptive to such feedback, they will never know that all but one person on the team thinks that's the dumbest button they've ever seen in their life, right? So you have to make sure you have a manager that's willing to accept feedback, even of the negative variety. And this is a problem I've seen in many organizations, not having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings. You want to schedule them every one to three weeks, right? At least once a month. And the reason for that is because if you are not having a conversation with your boss, this goes back to the earlier slide, then your boss doesn't know what you're doing. They don't know about your successes, they don't know about your wins, or what you need to so if your boss is not scheduling a one-on-one -on -one with them, with you, you schedule it with them. You'll stand out in almost certainly in a good way. All right, so where is your manager going? If you know their history, you also need to know where they're going next because your manager's success is your success. If your manager's trying to go up or run, you <coughs> need to know that because that's going, and maybe that's their number one career goal is to move up, right? And they're going to be looking at every way to do that. So if your manager is looking to move up and you can help them, they're going to be looking for people to take their place, right? So by helping them, your manager is going to know all about the good stuff you do, the contributions you made, and exactly your skill set and how you can be an asset for the company. More so than other people on the team that kind of try to stay away. They don't, they're not trying to be helpful. They're not trying to build everybody else around them. Managers are going to know nearly as much about them as they will about you. Your manager's goals will also affect how they interact with the rest of the organization. If they're not looking to move up, if they're kind of burning out, they're going to interact with other people in the organization, even other people on the same level, way, way, way differently than somebody that's highly motivated to grow and really build a plan. All right, this is more important for your bigger companies. But where exactly in the org chart is your manager? Is your manager a uh, team or a line manager? Is your manager more in uh, middle management? Or are they kind of in there in the, the C-suite, right? On top floor or something like that. So if you have a, a, a kind of close to the front order, quote unquote, right? Kind of a line or team manager, they're going to be probably sitting with the team, uh, focusing specifically on the team and the immediate neighbors. They're going to focus on that small and sort group more so than the organization at large. And so the way they behave is different. Uh, your middle management are, will be wide, mostly focused on spreading information across other teams, unsiloing information, ensuring that you have cross functional communication and stuff happening between teams. You have your development team over here, you have your marketing team over here. If you have a middle manager, that manager is the information conduit between those two teams. And you'll want to know that because that's where you're going to acquire that information. And of course, your senior management is focused on public perception and high level goals. They're the ones that are worried about the bottom line, they're the ones worried about PR, uh, they're less worried about, say, unsiloing information or radiating information or worried about specific team members. They've got really big business goals to keep on in their brain that middle managers and team level man and line managers just don't have. And so understanding the difference in maybe what will stress them, what they're worried about, what their goals are at each level will help you in communicating with them. So you want to look for managers growing, right? When your boss does well, ask yourself why, and then learn from it, right? It could be like a little mentoring situation. Why did your boss grow from being 
uh, a team lead to a manager to a director or something like that, right? What did they do correctly? And how can you replicate that? And hopefully, your manager is feeding back information about what works well for them, how do they connect well with other parts of the company, and feeding that information back to you so you can have a better working relationship with other people there. So remember, you have to shift process. Managers eat and breathe process and artifacts. Status reports, oh, they love them. So you want to help your manager shift it, right? The bigger the company, the more important the process is. When you have three people, it doesn't matter. You can all talk on the cell phone and be fine, and that's the most process you need. It's a cell phone number. But when you have 300 people, you can't do that anymore. You have to rely on something more uh, on the rails. Uh, it doesn't always have to be formal, like status reports or anything like that. Uh, it could be just your stickies on a Kanban wall if you want. Just making sure that there's regular communication at all points. If you're not having regular communication with other people on your team, your boss, your manager, etc., then you have a problem. But if you need help figuring out how to do that communication well, there's Agile, there's Scrum, there's all sorts of methods out there. Just go with them. Probably Agile. All right, again, learn to say no. So this is reality. If a team never questions their boss's decisions or recommendations, the boss is going, will think that their decisions are always questions. Always. Because nobody tells them no, right? Nobody ever tells you no. How do you know that what you're doing is not the best thing, not the best decision? That doesn't mean you have to you know, throw it back at them and say, oh, this sucks. You're the worst. No. But I mean, you can do positive encouraging feedback, right? Like instead of maybe you don't like many tests, and your boss really wants to push more testing, but you like RSpec more, you can give some feedback on why RSpec would be better. Don't be afraid to ask, like, why are you pushing many tests over RSpec if you're an RSpec fan? Good managers will take that pushback gracefully. And everybody's going to be better off for it because it's a, a, that conversation that has to happen. And with that conversation, you'll pass information in order. All right. Finally, managing others. You want to hire slow and fire quickly. Uh, if you go on Hacker News and you search for this, you'll find a bunch of more information about that and a bunch of people agree. But, uh, the more people that you have around the team that really want to be there, that want to grow others, that want to help people, that want to make something awesome, the better you're going to be. If you hire somebody that's just not doing that, they're, just, they're not making your day-to-day -day better, get rid of them immediately. Get rid of them yesterday, it doesn't matter if you replace them. So hire slow, fire fast. Bad employees will cost more than a raw salary. They'll make other people quit. They'll make other people do a worse job. And they're going to be paying salary for people who are Demoralized and slower at writing code because they hate their job. Don't do it. If you're a manager, please, please, please fight for your team. Don't be lulled into covering your own rear end. Uh, you want to always know what your team wants and what your team's gripes are before you walk into a, a meeting with your own boss. And you want to make sure that you know uh, that your team knows how the battle's going. So if your team asks you to go fight for them on their behalf, Follow up, let them know, right? Let them know if they're getting what they want or not and why. Uh, like I said earlier, always be coding. The higher up the manager chain you go, the less time you'll have to code. I understand, I get it. Um, just do it. Make sure you know how to do it. Don't be the person that said, I did COBOL 50 years ago and I don't know how to code anymore, right? Don't, don't be that person. And also, if you're always coding and you're a manager, please don't. Make it the most important part of the app. It needs to be something off to the side. Okay, you want to build out T-shapes. Your team's going to fit together like a set of puzzle pieces. You want to essentially shore up everybody's weaknesses, including your own, especially your own. And you want to hire people that complement your other existing developers that you enjoy working with and you're going to keep around with. So not all the most amazing developers have a T-shape that's best for your team's needs, and that's okay. As long as they're kind of close, it'll be all right. But by thinking about T-shapes and 
being and knowing every individual person uh, on your team's team shape, you'll have a much better understanding of their weaknesses and be able to account for it. Can you explain what you mean by T shape, please? Oh, yes. So uh, the question was, what is a T shape? What does that mean? So a T shape is uh, I forget who made it, but it's a, it's a simple graph where uh, the, the white part, the T, is the breadth of your knowledge, and this is where on one end you put you know, Postgres, you know, MySQL, et cetera, on the back end, on the other end, you put all the front end stuff, you know, you put all the middleware stuff, you know. Uh, and you, you just go in depth. And if, if you're like me and you are not a big fan of JavaScript, then you're going to be heavier on the back end part of the T shape. And then you're going to work together uh, really well with somebody that is really good at the front end. Maybe they know stimulus and are a huge evangelist for it. Uh, but they, maybe they don't like backend stuff so much. They don't like optimizing Postgres queries. It's just not fun in their day. Well, that person can say, send that to me. And when I have some CSS that's driving me nuts, off it goes to them. And both of us are happier and more productive for it. So that's the whole T-shaped thing. So find out what, what people are really, really, really good at and what they know just a little bit. So kind of like this talk is, you want to be a self-improvement evangelist. It doesn't have to be code-related. If you haven't read The Healthy Programmer, please read it. It's an amazing book. It teaches you how to not die from sitting all day at your desk. It's horrible for your health. Really bad. Go check it out. You also want to set a budget for improvement. Always be reading books. I've listed a few of the favorite books for this talk. Uh, I pretty much don't read fiction anymore. It's all nonfiction. Uh, reading books uh, is, is, and sharing the information that you read with others is really, really healthy and good for your career. And it can be easy. You can do a, a weekly lunch and learn. If you're a boss, do not sit on bad news. Layoffs and reorders are terrible, but they happen, right? Necessary part of business. So the best situation is when your boss tells you, as soon as possible, that your job is not going to be there soon, right? And you need to find a new one. That team's going to be much more thankful for that heads up, and they're more likely to cooperate with you and make it a, a less upsetting time. Okay, pass the Jolt test. Jolt test has been around for a few years now. But it's a really easy bullet point, not just for managers on, on what's improved. If you're a manager, but like you need to make sure you're doing all this, of course. But if you are a job seeker, ask, ask about these things, find it out, see if the company's passing the Joel test. If they don't use source control and you're writing code all day, you're going to have a bad day, I guarantee. It's going to be a source of frustrations. If nobody's keeping track of the bugs, you're are going to have problems. If programmers are always being interrupted all day, that's a problem. If, you know, if, if, if nobody's fixing bugs, it's all new code, new code, new code, there's no time for bugs, you're going to have problems. So make sure you understand where your source of problems will be. And if you're a manager, please fix them. You can read more about the control test on Google. And remember the basics. So people really want to do a good job. People want to contribute. I don't know about y'all, but when I go home on a Friday and I push a feature and I ship it to a customer and they say, oh my god, this is amazing, I feel on top of the world, right? I feel super lovely, I want to party. Uh, so people want to do a good job, they want to contribute. Employees work best when they have choices, uh, when they have options. Humans will take more responsibility for their own decisions than they will for a decision pushed upon them. They'll care about that, that decision more. It'll be very personal for them. Collaborative work is dependent upon relationships, good, effective, open communication that happens frequently. And people are more likely to be treated like, or more likely to act like adults when they're treated like adults. So, you know, the, the micromanager that's always, you know, what website are you looking at now? What are you doing now? Right? Those people are going to act out in ways that normal developers not being my managers never do. All right, well, that's all I've got.
Any thoughts, questions, concerns?